Hello everyone, this is Android Lecture 3. Today we'll be discussing some of the back end when working with Android. So network connections, different threads, data parsing, different forms of data and all of that kind of stuff. We'll also be talking about concurrency for quite a bit. So things to consider when we're doing network calls. Before that, how do what exactly is a network call? Usually that involves using some sort of a local area network or the internet. So whenever you click on a certain URL, which is a form of URI, a URL is a subset of URI, your browser will go use that URL to fetch data from the internet, so usually from a remote computer. We're all familiar with this, we use it all the time on our phones and our desktops, but here are some considerations to take into account. They take a lot of time compared to things that can be done on the device. So compare adding two numbers or you know clicking a button and picking up the click when, as, uh, as compared to downloading data from network. It takes a lot of time to connect, to find that computer, to and then to analyze that data. And also they're unpredictable. They may never succeed. If you enter the elevator while you're in the middle of downloading something, the, the connection won't go through. Or sometimes the network won't even be there. And on Android uh, devices, and actually iOS and other platforms as well, you need to request the permission to use Internet. And there are other permissions, of course, such as detecting the state of the Internet. That's also a separate permission. And also, one last thing to keep in mind is sometimes there's actual multiple steps. So with Facebook, whenever you open an app in the beginning, there's authentication that happens. And then you can start fetching data. Or with Twitter, you might have to do this on your bootcamp as well. You need to authenticate when the app launches and prevent the user from doing anything that could break the app while it's still authenticating. Once it's authenticated, that's when you want things to actually start coming through. So sometimes you have two different requests happening, or sometimes you can, you would have been authenticated, but the user signed on another account, and so when you go request something, the server will come back saying, hey, you're no longer authenticated, please authenticate, and you, to, you need to be able to handle that across the entire app. Now, that's where calls take time, and it's unpredictable. If you guys remember, Android has only one UI thread. And that means if you do some networking logic on the UI thread, it'll block. It'll wait until the network comes back. You won't be able to refresh the UI. It'll, it'll, it'll freeze. The user won't be able to touch the screen. He won't be able to see things move. Um, the phone will just freeze because the UI thread can only be doing one thing at one point. And if it's doing your network call, it can't refresh the screen. So here's, uh, here's what Android does to prevent that. It actually throws a network on main thread exception if you try to do any kind of network calls on the main thread. So in conclusion, we need to make them run on a separate thread. We need to make them run somewhere else. We can't have them run on the UI thread because, well, one, Android won't let us. Two is we probably don't want to. It'll hug up our app. And uh, so we need to put them on another thread. But how does that really work? Because now we have more than one thread in our app. So multi-threading. Most uh, for those of you who have not dealt with parallelism or concurrency before, most of your applications ran through in that one function called main. You started doing things, and by the time you finished doing things that were sequential in one straight processing line, it finishes at the end of main, and that's it. Now. In, in here and many other cases, you want things to happen simultaneously. You want the UI to continue to refresh while you're downloading things from the network. Now, keeping in mind, even though you only have one core on your machine sometimes, that one core can run multiple threads at the same time, kind of. That's the difference between um, concurrency and true concurrency, or sometimes they call it false concurrency and true con con concurrency. So a core can switch around between different threads very, very quickly. On, on, on Windows machines, one number used to be 10,000 times a second. It would switch between threads. So sometimes you have 100-something threads on your machine, but it looks like they're all running at the same time because the core just switches back and forth really quickly. So true concurrency is when you have multiple cores on that machine and two threads are actually running in parallel simultaneously executing instructions. Now, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't really matter which form of concurrency we're dealing with as long as you consider that things are happening in parallel and need to make sure that they run fine. So let's, let, let's look into some considerations. What should I separate? What should go on my UI thread? What shouldn't go on my UI thread? What should go on other threads in general? So what if I have some database access? What if I have some networking logic? Uh, 
I won't go into it in very much detail here, but different kinds of processing will require different kinds of um, will uh, will will require to allocate different number of threads to them. For example, when you are decoding an image off the disk, or you're downloading something, um, sorry, or you're saving something to disk, or you're doing intense calculations or database access, all of these are very processor intensive. Um, functions. What else? But for example, if you're dealing with networks, so if you're downloading something off the internet, there's not much processing or writing or calculations that's happening there as much as waiting for data to arrive. So those threads will yield a lot, as in they'll tell the operating system often, hey, I don't have anything else to do. And it goes off and another thread comes in. So you don't, you want, if you have many, so one processor intensive thread is always the UI thread. It's always doing things. It's processing input. It's making sure that your, you know, clock is running fine. Um, all of, all, all, most of the phone happens on the UI thread. So the UI thread is very, very busy. And more, assuming your phone only has one core, you want that one core to be working on the UI thread most of the time. So it's fine to have your UI thread do most of the processor intensive work, and then you have a bunch of th threads on the side that yield a lot, so like networking threads. Now, m more recently, phones will, will have two or more cores. I think starting gingerbread phones starting have to have two or more cores, which means you could have two processor intensive threads and maybe get away with a third if it switches back and forth, and a lot of threads that yield. So a lot of one common thing is you have two to three threads doing networking, but only one thread saving to disk. So once all three networking threads are done, they'll throw their logic onto the processing thread, and that'll save things to disk. Same happens when you're decoding images off of disk. So what to separate is something that you should consider and test for. So just try it on a few phones and make sure it doesn't slow down your uh, your your app. And another thing to consider is communication mechanisms. So lots of times you launch a separate thread to do something, but you want it to communicate back to the initial thread or some other thread. So for example, you click a certain button, like refresh on Twitter. It goes, fetches tweets, downloads them, processes them, and displays them. But where do they get displayed? You can't display them off the background thread. You have to display them on the UI thread. So there is communication happening between those two threads. So, well, what about... We'll get to synchronization in a second. What about failure? So what happens if you click refresh and you back out of the app? So you click refresh and you back out. So you are, the UI is gone. What happens to the other thread? If the other thread keeps going and then finishes, when it tries to communicate back to the UI thread and displays results, things are probably going to fail. Or maybe you will display results, and which is not what you want. If the user backed out of the app, you don't want to show him results anymore. He said he has, he's declared that he's not interested. Another thing is synchronization, atomicity. So let's say, um, let's think of a quick example here. Let's say two threads want to work on the same data set. They're both trying to increment a certain number. So you have two different threads counting two parts of a database, and they'll, all, they'll both report, hey, I've counted this much, and you want to count the total sum. So what happens if each of these threads has a local copy of the variable? Let's say the variable initially starts off as 0, and each one has 100. So each thread has a value of zero. You get a hundred, and you get a each one counts to a hundred. And sorry, each one has their local variable. They have it as zero. They count to hundred. So each local variable is, is at a hundred now. Now then, they can both report to the UI thread with a hundred each. Add them up, and then we're done. But however, what if the variable was shared? What if that one variable was not local to each thread, but was a global one that's shared all amongst them? So what happens is, each thread will start counting. But if they have cached copies in their cores, just a cache, a temporary visible working copy. So he read it, and he's about to put it back in. So one thread goes like, okay, I found a new item. What is the value of the variable right now? And it says 25. And then he goes like, okay, cool. Well, the value now should be 26. But what happens if another thread was doing this simultaneously? So both threads will read the value as 25, go like, okay, cool. And then one thread makes it 26, and the other thread still assumes it's 25, and also writes 26. We lost a count there. You can't actually write simple tests for this. If you don't include any synchronization, it won't work. And it's the same thing with bank accounts. So when you go to your ATM, let's say two people are on two different machines, 
and the bank account says you have a hundred dollars. Two people go in, read a balance of a hundred, because no one has withdrawn anything yet, and they both click the withdraw button at the same time. Each machine will look at the number, and go like, oh, there's a hundred dollars. It'll subtract a hundred and save zero. And the other machine will go like there's a hundred dollars, subtract a hundred and save zero, and they both save zero. But what you actually withdrew was two hundred dollars. So there's a, there's a sense of at atomicity that you want here, which is a, tr a transaction either completely happened or didn't. You don't want one of the ATMs to read, and then write in two different steps. You want it to be one transaction. That ATM either took the full hundred and got it over with, or it didn't. You don't want to look at the 100 go like, oh, I have 100, I'm going to start withdrawing, and another one to come in and be able to read the 100 and start withdrawing as well. Once one guy starts reading the number and starts um, saying, I'm interested in this and I'm going to manipulate this number, and the other guy comes in, you want that other guy to wait. That guy will wait and go like, okay, someone else is manipulating this number right now. The first ATM will read it write it, read it, change it, write it, withdraw, and then once he's done writing, he'll release the lock, he'll go like, okay, I'm done, and then the other third comes in, and all he sees a zero. So that's the, sen that's the essence of synchronization. You have two things happen in parallel, but you want them to be synchronized. You want to make sure that they don't interfere with each other. You don't, uh, you don't want that critical section to have any overlap in it with, between the threads. The critical section is the part where it's dangerous if things happen simultaneously. So that's synchronization, that's atomicity. We need to work with that as well. So there's two ways, well, there's more than two ways, but we will go through two ways of achieving synchronization. One is using locks, as I mentioned, so mutex locks, as in every ATM account, for example, this is just an example, every bank account will have a certain lock with it. And every person, before they actually open up the account and start to change any numbers, We'll look at that lock, ask it, hey, lock, uh, we'll try to acquire that lock, saying, I am the one who's using this right now. If the lock is already acquired, they will just wait. They will just block, as that's what they're called. It's a blocking mechanism. They just wait. They're stuck at that until they acquire the lock. Now, if the lock is not used, they do acquire the lock and they go into the critical section and start doing things. At the end of, of their code, when they're done, they should release the lock and then the other person, who, if, if anyone else was waiting on the lock, they will enter. That's the most common form of locks. There are other kinds, so there's barriers and semaphores and other ones as well. Barriers are when you have many, many threads dealing with the same sort of data and you want them to be synchronized all together, not really in terms of uh, one critical section, only one guy can access this data, but you want all four threads to, for example, If they're looking at the game of life by Conway, you can look this up later on. You have a big board, and every every step, every step in the life of the board is determined by this the, the the current state of the board. Every block is dependent on the blocks around it. So you can split the board in four and have four separate threads go through and analyze it and prepare for the next stage. But you don't want any of the threads to start actually processing the next stage until they're all done together because then they'll be reading inappropriate, uh, in, like, uh, wrong data. So you want to make sure all the threads finish that one step. Once they're done with that one step, they all update the board together and then move on. That's where you want uh, threads to be synchronized together. That's where you use barriers. Semaphores are things we use with resources. So for example, let's say on your CPU you have two units that can help you add numbers. Then you'll have a semaphore with a size of two. So if someone comes in and says, hey, I want to add numbers, they can acquire one and the semaphore goes down to one. And then, next, and then another person comes in and says, hey, I want to add a number as well, and he makes it go down to zero. They both start adding numbers. Once a third person comes in and tries to acquire a semaphore, it'll go like, hold on, wait, both of them are busy. Once And once one of those two guys inside finishes, they can release the lock or increment the semaphore and the next guy will come in. So it's a different kind of lock, not really for critical sections, but making sure resources work. That's one common use for it. Now Java 
actually allows you to Java natively supports mutex locks by on on any object, any object you want, you can lock on it. So that actually like, gives a nice benefit, which means you can use the actual object itself that you're afraid of being manipulated as the lock, which is actually commonly used. And you can do that with a synchronized keyword. We'll look into this later on. Now, there is another kind of synchronization without locks, in a way. Now, the problem with locks is, as I said, they're blocking. As in, a thread will hold there on the lock until things get through. Now, that could provide a lot of issues. It could provide uh, lag. It could, provide un it could cause unresponsiveness. It could also cause, cause things called deadlocks. If, uh, we'll go through this a lot uh, again later on, but if you have two mutex locks, A and B, thread A, so you have, the, you have two mutex locks, A and B, and you have two threads, A1 and 2. Thread 1 wants to acquire lock A and then lock B. Thread 2 wants to lock, acquire lock B and then lock A. Let's say thread 1 acquires lock A, and then thread gets uh, it goes off the core of, of the CPU and then thread 2 comes in it comes in tries to acquire lock B no one has B it acquires B just like uh, thread 1 locked uh, acquired lock A no one was using it now in this situation A was a uh, thread 1 was able to acquire lock A because no one's using it thread 2 was able to acquire lock B because no one's using it but they can't move forward anymore because thread 1 is waiting on lock B Thread 1 now wants to acquire lock B, but lock B is held by thread 2. And thread 2 wants to acquire lock A, but it's held by lock 1, and they can't move forward from that point. That is what's called a deadlock, and it actually sometimes happens when your PC completely freezes. When there's absolutely nothing you can do to move the mouse, to respond, to make an application respond, that is usually a deadlock. So there's lots of synchronization issues. Now you can avoid that without you by not using locks. So another method is kind of using the Android Looper. It's synchronization without locks. The basic idea is that all responses are recorded or dealt with on the same thread. So for example, what you can do is you can, for example, on your eye, you hit a button, you fire off a new thread to download the data. But once the down, once the data is downloaded you need to make sure that the UI is still there. You don't. Want, you also want to make sure there's some synchronization there. You don't want to throw in the data on the UI while the UI is being destroyed. You either want the UI to completely destroy and then you detect that it's destroyed, or you want to detect that the UI has not been destroyed yet and then throw in the data. Now you can get around that by saying, hey, you know what, once you're done uh, downloading the data, just move on to move to the UI thread and on the UI thread you can check because the UI thread can only be doing one thing at one point which means that if you are currently on the UI thread processing the data then that means that the activity is not being destroyed because it can't be in the middle of being destroyed as you do another thing on the UI thread so the basic idea is that if you make all the results or all the processing happening on the same thread that you're afraid of locking with or having issues with, then you can make sure that there's no synchronization issues. Because then, as I said, the, the main issue with that is I don't want to throw in the data as it's being destroyed. But if the UI thread is it's the UI thread that does the destroying, and the UI thread can only be doing one thing at one point. So if I take my processing of the data and put that logic also on the UI thread, then what happens is as I'm processing the data, then the UI is either completely fine or has been completely destroyed. It cannot be in the middle of destroying because that would mean the UI thread is destroying right now, but when, when in fact the UI thread is actually processing the data. Uh, we'll go through this a little bit more in lecture, but that's another method of synchronization without locks, in a sense, where you do the same logic on the UI thread so that you don't have to deal with the UI thread doing something else at the same time. How does that work, though? Because a thread is usually just doing following a straight line sequence of instructions. Well, it's a little bit of a different mechanism here. It's used uh, in many different systems, but it's actually uh, it's it's the basis of the Android system. So what happens is there's an Android looper. There's one thread, the main, the main thread, that keeps looping on a queue. It waits for things to run and runs things on the queue in, the, in their appropriate order, first in, first out, I believe. So what happens is UI threads, so when you click a button and, that, and in that button you say I want to finish the activity and leave it, 
first thing that happens is the moment you click the button, something goes on the UI thread uh, looper on the queue that says analyze this touch event. Eventually, it'll, it'll realize that this is a click and that will propagate down to the onClick method. In your onClick method, you say finish to finish the activity. Now, that will actually won't finish the activity in line because if you remember, for an activity to get to destroyed, it has to get paused, stopped, and then destroyed. So there's, li there's methods there, there's life cycles, and they can't happen in line. They can't happen right there. So what happens is when you call finish, it actually throws on logic on the queue to say, hey, next, I want to be destroyed and put it on the queue. And that's how those methods is being destroyed or is destroying or is finishing on an activity. There's a method that tells you if it's being finished or not. It works on that basis. Is, if, is, the, is the finish, is the on stop, on destroy, and on pause on the queue? I got those in the wrong order. On the queue, if they are, then I'm scheduled to be destroyed. And so that's the basic idea of the looper. And when you want to throw something back on the UI thread, you throw it on that looper. Now, there is only you can have any thread on Android become a looper, but there's only one that is the main looper, which is the UI thread. We will also be using this when we're working with it. Now, keep in mind, async tasks, which, are, which is a, a nice convenience class provided by Android to help you move things off of the UI thread, they actually require a looper. You cannot execute an async task off of any thread that does not have a looper, usually the main thread. We have run into issues where we would take an async task and try to launch it off of another thread. So we have your UI thread, you have your other thread, and then you, we launch our async task off of the other thread to be a third thread. That doesn't actually work unless there's a looper involved. We'll go through this as well later on. So. That's the basic idea with multi-threading. You need to be able to deal with synchronization. You need to make sure you don't have deadlocks. You want to think of where, where do you want to put some logic on the UI thread, not do you want to use synchronization? Do you just want to use uh, uh, throw things on the UI thread? The, the disadvantage of throwing things on the UI thread is you're throwing things on the UI thread, so it might slow down the UI. But anyway, so let's move on, on to how to actually make network calls. There's two main methods on Android. There's the HTTP client provided by Apache, default client, HTTP get, all of those classes from Java. And then there's the Android's HTTP URL connection. Now, most people use HTTP client because they're more familiar with Java. However, HTTP URL connection is a little more stable when used properly. Google recommends using that if you're, if you're supporting Gingerbread and above. If you need to support Froyo, then uh, what, we, what they recommend is you implement HTTP client logic for Froyo and only Froyo, or Froyo and below, which is Android 2.2. And then Gingerbread and above, you, you stick with HTTP URL connection. We will be, be using that when we're downloading things off the internet. Now, don't forget to actually use the internet. You actually have to specify that you are going to be using that permission in your Android manifest so that the Google Play Store can recognize that and actual operating system to allow you to do it. If you don't specify the permission, your network call will fail and it won't, give, it won't tell you why. So what are the common data formats? When you connect with the server, when you say, I want some data, so let's look at Reddit, for example. When you download the data from Reddit or get a news article from another app, they don't download the entire web page. That's too much background and colors and stuff that's not really necessary. All you want is the pure data. You want the article. So the most common form is JSON. JavaScript object notation. We will go through this in depth. XML is another form that's actually used as well. However, XML is a little less common. We've been using XML the entire time on Android. SOAP is even less common. I've never actually worked with it before, but I know that it is a relatively common way of transmitting data over the internet. The most common over the internet are, always, are JSON and XML. On Android, it's JSON by far. You want something that's succinct, easier to parse and efficient in terms of data. You don't want big text. HTML is a lot of waste. XML has actually quite a bit of waste as well. SOAP is even worse. JSON is pretty succinct and it's really easy to relate to Java classes and that kind of stuff. So XML, we've been using this in Android all over the place. There's all your strings in your values folders. Values AR is like saying values Arabic where you would put strings for Arabic. Values FR, French and so on and so forth. Um, you can also throw in values, just like IDs, arrays, dimensions, so this is numbers, just pure values, not 
no, nothing more than just a value. So arrays, for example, you can put in, uh, when you have a drop-down list with a bunch of words, you can put those in arrays. You can have styles. So this is there's always one provided to you by default when you create an Android app. It will be the default system's uh, style. So that includes things like fonts, colors, paddings, text sizes, all of that kind of stuff. Your view hierarchies that you define also are in XML. You can actually define, you can add in your own raw XML if you'd like on your app to parse on runtime. So sometimes configuration files work that way. Drawables. So not the drawables as in images that you put on HDPI and XHDPI and so on and so forth. These are drawables that define shapes, gradients, solids, strokes, layer lists, all of those kinds of stuff are defined in XML. And last but not least, your actual Android manifest is defined in XML. So we have some experience with XML. It's not very extensive um, and it doesn't use XPath or any of the other features. It's purely just XML to, to display some information. Now JSON, it stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's very close to JavaScript and you can actually transmit code, like JavaScript code in JSON, not very commonly used on Android. Uh, I mean, just the transferring code part. So this is the most common form of data transfer on uh, code, uh, data transfer on Android. It's what usually websites give you when, you're deal when they're dealing with mobile. Even with iOS, it's pretty much the same thing. It's the most preferred because it's really close to Java. It's really easy to work with. You can do it within a couple of minutes. You don't have to do the parsing yourself. You can just use tools such as JSON. We'll be seeing that in a minute to do all the parsing for you. It's natively supported. There are uh, there are JSON object and that kind of stuff in Java in Android at least. It's really easy to understand and relate to Java. It's Based on key value pairs, we'll see that in a second, which is how classes are structured. Not like XML, we have attributes and elements. And it's a tree. It's a little bit easier in Java. It's easy to debug and generate. So a lot of times when you're building an app, the server is not ready, and then you can just formulate, you can write down your own uh, J JSON. Um, so there's lots of JSON generating utilities online and also there are plugins that will allow you to display JSON interactively in your browser not just as a blob of text. Now one disadvantage is it's, it's not dynamic. So what I mean by that is if a certain field has the same name but it could be one of two different types that's actually a real big pain to deal with in JSON. There are ways to deal with it, there are ways to get around it. However it's actually annoying. So Basically, you want every variable in your model to always be the exact same type, or else it's a pain. So let's do a quick example. Key value pairs like a dictionary, as I said. The supported types are string, numbers, booleans, arrays, object, and null. So object and null kind of go together, because if you can have object, you can have null. So strings are like text, you can have numbers, you can have booleans, and then you can have arrays of strings, numbers, booleans, objects, or null or other arrays. So in your array, you can have any other JSON element you like. Here's a simple example. So my dictionary says name is equal to Muhannad, age is equal to 23, male equals true. I did male equals true instead of sex equals male because I wanted to demonstrate Boolean, not a string. So this is what the JSON would look like. Of course, formatting is not really important. You can have those spaces, but usually people drop them in, in for the sake of efficiency. It's easier to parse that way and it's uh, less data. But just to make it more visible, this is what that JSON would look like. You can take these and throw them, throw, throw them to JSON validator and it'll tell you it is true if you'd remove all the formatting as well. So that's what a very basic, basic JSON looks like. There's name, colon, muhannad, age, colon, 23, male, colon, true. Now keep in mind, now notice, everything on the left side of the colon, which is the key, is, in, is usually in quotes. That's a string. On the right side, it may have quotes or not, depending on if it's a string or not. So Muhannad is a string, it has quotes. 23 is not a string, it's just a number. And true is not a string, it's just true. Here's a little more complicated of an example. So here we only saw string, number, and boolean. What we want to see now is array, object. I won't actually include null, but you can just write null. So here's a, another example. So we want to model a city. The city's name is Toronto. Its location is an object which specifies coordinates, and those are the two coordinates. Then I have people, which is an array, Muhannad, Imad, Mahmoud, and then I have points of interest, which is an array of coordinates. Each coordinate is an object, by the way. I just copied the same GPS value more than once. I didn't really want to look for points of interest. And then we have our population, which is just a number. 
So this we already know how to do. So it's simply uh, you open your bases and close your bases because it's an object at the top level. This whole thing is just one object. So open bases, close uh, curly bases, uh, quotes, name, colon, quotes, Toronto. But then we have location, which is an object. The way that works is on the left side is the same. So quotes, location, colon, uh, quotes, colon, and then come open bra uh, curly braces, coordinates, and curly braces again. That's how you define one object. We'll see this in a second. For people, you use for arrays, you use square braces. So, and then inside your square braces, you just have a comma separated list. Make sure you do not put a comma at the end. Points of interest is a combination of both. So it's curly, it's it's square braces, uh, square brackets. Sorry for an array, but each item inside is not just a string; it's an object. And then you have at the end your population. That's what this looks like. Let's look at by line by line. So that at the top here is the open brace and you have one at the bottom here you can barely see it that's the whole object this is the just top level JSON object the first field we said was name Toronto comma the next thing was a location object which is of type coordinates so location is the the key the value is an object that contains an X and a Y so if you look at this this is a JSON object on its own kinda of similar to that and then we have people, which is, uh, so co so there's a comma to separate between the items. So there's your name, there's your location, there's also a comma here to separate the items within the location. Here's your comma, you have people, which is an array, so open uh, square brackets, you have three people inside, no comma at the end, because this is the end of the array. And then comma to move on to the next, which is points of interest. So here's what an a coordinates object looks like. Here's what an array looks like. Here's an here's what an array of coordinate objects looks like. So we start with open uh, and close square brackets, and then we have two items inside. Each is of type location. They look exactly the same as this. Well, actually, it's the same data as well, but the data could be different. I wrote the coordinate in as an actual uh, what do you call it? As an actual uh, quote. But you can actually put in here a number if you'd like, a floating point number, or anything like that. And that's the basic idea. So here's your point of interest, the key, the value is an array of objects. Here's your objects. JSON actually says the objects don't need to be of the same type, but I've never seen that the case because usually if you have an array, they're all the same type. If they're not, it could be it could turn out to be a little bit weird to parse. I've never encountered that before. And at the very end, after our array, points of interest array, comma, and then we have our population, and then our closing base at the end. There's no comma at the end of population because that's where the JSON ends. Now, top level of the of a JSON must be an object or array. Our previous examples were objects. If you look here, that's an open base for an object, and here as well, open base for an object. Now you could have the top level be an array. So for example, when you request a news article or results from Reddit, sometimes the top level is an array. It's just an array of a whole bunch of articles or the, the items on Reddit. So the top level can be this. So here, here's a valid JSON on its own. It's just an array of strings. Or here's another one. It's an array of location of coordinate objects. Here I just use dots instead of actual coordinates. But here's my X. Y commas, here's one object and here's another object, and then that's the end of the array. This is actually a valid JSON as well. It's just open braces, it's just braces, it's an empty array. And here's here's another one. This is not exactly an empty array, it's an, actually an array with one item, but the only item inside is null. And this actually works well with Java. You can have an array of items, just it's you can have the array of size zero which would be the second to last line, or you can have an array of size one, but there's no items inside, and that would be null. And that's basically the end of JSON, and that's how it works. We'll be writing and working with this a lot. And so now, how do we parse this? So I requested data, and we got that JSON. But how do I make use of it? I don't want to deal with strings. I want to deal with Java objects and strings and Java numbers and that kind of stuff. So JSON is a library that uses reflection to relate classes to JSON fields and parse appropriately. Now, for those of you who don't know what reflection is, reflection is kind of meta programming in a sense, where you're writing code to actually analyze the code in a sense. So if you have a class and you have a string, um, so let's say you have a class that mimics this. So you have a string called name, you have an integer called age, and you have a boolean called male. 
in your class. And the class's name is uh, type is called member, for example. In with reflection, you can actually ask that class object, do you have a string field? And it'll tell you yes in, in code, and you can get its name. So you can get field names out of your code using reflection. It's a little bit weird, but it actually works. This is, for those of you who have only worked with C and C++ and that stuff before, this is a little bit different because usually whatever, what I name my variable doesn't really matter. I just use it appropriately and reuse it. But with reflection, it does. Because what JSON assumes, what JSON assumes is that the fields in the JSON will have the same name as the fields in your class. So if you named your string name, if you, if you called your string name in your class, it'll work because JSON will, uh, JSON will read the JSON, find that there's a string called name, and look in your class for a string called name. Now if you change it, it won't be able to find that, and your model, your class won't be able to be generated and filled appropriately. Now if you do want to remove that dependency, you can use the at serialize name tag, and uh, that eliminates that, and you can name the variable whatever you wish. Now, the beauty of this is you just create your class the way you like it, and JSON will do the rest. You can just ignore fields, it won't populate them, and you can create extra ones, and JSON won't worry about it. As long as you define the ones you want, it'll just parse them for you automatically. You don't have to deal with the string at all. You just give it the class, you give it the string, and it returns to you an object that's already filled in. We will be using this in our examples. Now, keep in mind, reflection is not very fast. So this is meant for simplicity. This library is meant for simplicity, readability, and quick and quick development of effort. It's really easy to understand, really easy to see, really easy to work with. It's not built for efficiency. It's not particularly fast. It's not very slow either. It's actually commonly used because it's reasonably fast. But it's but if you are if you're parsing like ginormous amounts of data, you probably don't want to be using JSON. You want to use something a little bit faster, maybe. But that's the end of this. So there's lots of info on these slides. Many of the concepts actually require a full course to explain in depth. So concurrency, parsing, um, different communication mechanisms, um, synchronization, all of that requires a lot of, uh, even just figuring out what to separate on two different things can have, can have a full course just on that. The, so the, you might be taking courses on this if you're in computer science as you go. You may have taken some already. But if you're not, the basics I explained here are good enough to get you started. And just if you follow a few basic rules, you can make sure that you won't run into issues. Just no, don't have deadlocks, which are easier to prevent. Um, we will go through that later on. And don't, uh, or use no synchronization, uh, no locks, sorry, and just throw things back on the same thread. That could be made, that can make it easier. They'll become more, they'll become easier as you go with experience. There's lots of readings on concurrency in Java. Keep an eye out. I'll be sending some of these out later on while we're working on projects. But one thing to keep in mind, debugging concurrent code is seriously difficult. It sometimes takes weeks upon months on, on Android apps. This is just an Android app. On bigger projects, it even takes longer. The problem with this is what's what we call race conditions, which is that one time you run it, one thread finished something before the other thread, and that's why the issue popped up. But the next time you run it, the things finished in the right order. And so it's really hard to de detect them, especially since there's no usual crash or bug that shows up. It's just weird behavior or freezing. And so it's really easy to trace down, and you can't really step through it and debug, because, because by stepping through it, you are further enhancing the race condition, because you're slowing one thread down and the other keeps going. So here's where you can consider like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle comes in, which is if you try to investigate what's happening on one other thread, you've manipulated the system enough that chances are the bug won't happen. I've had issues come up where um, writing print statements, printf statements, just to see what's happening on it was in C, just writing printf statements to see what's happening with the race condition actually solved it. That extra time it took to process the printf gave it enough time to finish. And so you, you're you stuck in a situation where if I debug, I'm going to break it. And if I put in a printf to see what's happening, the problem goes away. Those kinds of bugs are really, really difficult to deal with. If you run into any issues with concurrency, please let me know. I can help you out. Or go on Stack Overflow or ask any other experienced program, uh, software engineer.
Well, th that's it for this lecture, guys, and we'll see you in class. We'll be going through a lot of these. We'll also work with adapters to see how we can take the data, make it useful, and actually tie it into our app. And that's it. Thank you very much.